Dreaming of a vacation in Paris with art, intrigue, and a little romance? Then pick up Lost and Found in Paris by me, Leon Dolan, an art history treasure hunt in the City of Light. Available from William Morrow, wherever books are sold. Hi, this is Leon Dolan. I just wanted to let you know that this Satellite Sisters podcast is a repost of our interview from 2022 with thriller writer Dervla McTiernan. We were so happy to talk to her about The Murder Rule, and that is now out in paperback. There are also a couple other great topics on the show, and we talk about the books we pretend to have read, but we haven't really. So thanks for tuning in. Hope you enjoy this Beach, Beach Bag Books 2022. We'll be back in a couple weeks. Dreaming of a vacation in Paris with art, intrigue, and a little romance? Then pick up Lost and Found in Paris by me, Leon Dolan, an art history treasure hunt in the City of Light. Available from William Morrow, wherever books are sold. You're listening to Satellite Sisters. What's a satellite sister? The person you call when the best thing in your life happens or the worst. The person that gets you up, gets you going, and gets you through. And every once in a while, changes your mind. This podcast is part pep talk, part weekly check-in. Like grabbing coffee with a friend. Thanks for being here. Welcome to the Satellite Sisterhood. Welcome to Satellite Sisters. I'm Leanne Dolan here in Pasadena, California. I'm a writer, a producer, and for the purposes of today's show, I am a reader because it <laughs> is our 2022 Best Beach Bag Book Show. Very excited for this. Our question of the day, what classic would you love to read again for the first time? Mm. Liz, what do you think? Liz? Okay. I was thinking a lot about this, Leanne. I have a, this, there's a confession involved here. I think I basically only skimmed Moby Dick. I think that I, my, it was assigned and I claim to have read it, but it's probably worth a read. I hear it's worth a read. And so I might read it. Okay. All right. Really though? Do you want to read it? I kind of do. Why oh, okay. is it so, why is it so important to everyone? There must be something in there, Leanne, that the people keep talking about it. Okay. Right. Keep referencing it. Mm-hmm. It's a good yeah. name. It could just be that. Julie, how about you? Okay. Well, this is, it's not rereading it. It's actually reading it similar to Liz, um, Marcel Proust in search of lost time. I was in a senior seminar in college and was supposed to have read that book. It was about the same time that I started dating my husband and I got (laughs) kind of distracted. Uh, But for the last 30 some odd years, I've had a reoccurring nightmare that I'm unprepared to answer questions about this book in the senior seminar. So I Uh. feel like if I read it, do you think that nightmare of like not being prepared (laughs) will go away? Yes. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, try, well, it. try it. I'm going to try it. <laughs> Isn't that crazy that we still have those dreams? I yeah. know. The, I know. You didn't it's... do your homework dream. I mean, mm-hmm. even I'm saying sh- the name of the author, but just it always, you know, <laughs> takes me to a place. Right. Okay. Well, Lynn, how about you? One of my favorite books, maybe my favorite book, uh, top three for sure, is The Scarlet Letter by Nathaniel uh-huh. Hawthorne. Uh-huh. And, and I just had the chance to uh, read in advance a really good novel coming out in the fall called Hester, which is sort of the origin story of Hester Prynne. It's a it's a reimagining of Hester Prynne's origin story. It's based, you know. It's it's the woman Nathaniel Hawthorne might have based Hester Prynne on. So it was so good. I think it will be a big book for the fall. So I'm like, I should read The Scarlet Letter again. Now that I've read Hester, like go back in time. I've read The Modern, go back. So yeah, The Scarlet Letter would be the answer to my to the question. Okay. So. Good question, Liam. Yeah. Thank you. Thank mm-hmm. you. All right. Well, it is our best beach bag books episode today. We are having Dervla McTiernan will be on the show. Best-selling thriller and mystery author Dervla McTiernan joining us from Perth, Australia, but she's written a lot of books with a lot of uh, Irish accents. So that's why I, I discovered her in audiobook form during the pandemic. And I just have ripped through everything she's ever written. Julie and I read her new book, The Murder Rule. We both loved it. So we're loved excited it. to talk to Dervla. That will be great. Um, the list is everywhere we can possibly put it. Our official Best Beach Bag Books list is going to be at satellitesisters.com. 
We'll spread it all over social media. It, it's in the show notes right now as you are listening. It exists in the show notes. Um, it's going to be uh, in, in pep talk. Did I say that? I mean, it's it's. we have the bookstore at bookshop.org. So every place we can put it, we are trying to put the list, the complete list of books. It's about 15 books on the list. Includes, um, includes historical fiction. It includes romance, mysteries and thrillers, memoirs audio books, all kinds of different kinds of books, uh, family dramas. Uh, you know, it's a complete list. You can read them at the beach. You can read them at your lake house. You can read them on the plane. You can just stay home and read them. We don't care. We just, <laughs> just a name. So, <laughs> so we were each going to go through and pick one or two that we wanted to highlight from the list. So Liz, you start us off. Well, yeah, we decided Decided to start with The Palace Papers by Tina Brown, mm -hmm. because first of all, super newsy, so nonfiction, super newsy. But Tina Brown is a favorite here at Satellite Sisters. She's been on the show several times, starting when she wrote The Diana Chronicles, which was really just a great book. Even if you thought you already knew everything about what was really going on with Diana, you did not until you got Tina Brown's version. I feel the same way about The Palace Papers. It's The Palace Papers. Inside the House of Windsor, the truth and the turmoil. So, uh, Julie, I know you've started this too, right? You're I listening? gobbled this book up. In fact, mm -hmm. I'll admit to you, I started from the back because I wanted to read about the Meghan Markle part first. <laughs> so yeah. I read that first and then went to the front uh, of the book. I, I just loved it. And just as you said, Liz, I thought I was pretty well informed about what they've been up to over the last decade or so. And yet there were so many new details, so much insight. And uh, this is such a fun read. Yeah, it's like I thought it was going to be the the Windsor next gen, you yeah, know, yeah. but it's not. It's so much more. It's the history of Queen Elizabeth's 70 years on the throne, right. the whole sorry Charles and Diana years. And then you get to the dish. You get to Meghan, Harry, Kate, William. So it's like if they rolled all the seasons of the crown into one really good book and it was true, unlike the crown. So that's, there's a lot of history in here. Me be more than I needed. There are a lot of viscounts and lords and dames and duchesses, <laughs> frankly, that all blend into one cranky character to me. <laughs> but but Tina Brown, her writing is so sharp and so funny. Like, here are just two of my favorite sentences. How about this? So, you know, people make a lot of jokes about British teeth. And I mean, that's just such a cliche. Mm -hmm. But here it is by Tina Brown. She said, this was a crowd that could well afford the best Harley Street dentists, but you could root for truffles in the forest of bad teeth. OK, <laughs> I mean, this is why you have to read the Tina Brown version. I know my head snapped back when I read yeah. that line. Liz. Yeah. And then, then much later in the book, when she's getting into like the young adult lives of William and Harry, she, she wrote, I laughed out loud when I when I read this. Until he lost his hair, William was the biggest heartthrob to be heir to the throne since a pre-obese Henry VIII. I mean, come on. <laughs> <laughs> and it's just, the whole thing is really fascinating and charming and funny. And she can be a little snarky, but it's not too snarky. Anyway, I highly recommend The Palace Papers Inside the House of Windsor. Oh, good choice, Liz. Excellent. Oh, I can't wait. I can't wait. Did you listen to the audio book? I or did. did you yes. read it? Oh, does I, Tina I, read? Does Tina, Tina read? Tina reads it, and she is good at delivering her own material. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So All right. She some of these things she lands better than any narrator could, mm -hmm. just because <laughs> she is Tina Brown. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, I I put a whole bunch of books on the list, but I'm just going to highlight two. One is a romance, and one is historical fiction slash mystery. Okay. The first romance. I'm just going to say this. I hope it doesn't sound egotistical. Uh, this reminded me of me. This book. So I just like. <laughs> so mm, if really? you like. If you like my writing, I feel like you'll like Annabelle Monaghan's writing. Oh, and the name hey. the name of the book is called Nora Goes Off Script. And I thought our satellites, misters, would love it because you know how we love our our, our Hallmark movies, right? We yes. love to watch. We love to mock. We love to discuss. We love to have fun with them. Well, in Nora Goes Off Script, the main character is a screenwriter for 
for Hallmark type movies. Okay. Romance channel movies. And she's just gone through a disastrous divorce and she's living in her vacation home in upstate New York. And it has a great sense of place there. You really, you really feel like you're there sort of on the edge with her. as She's trying to pull her life back together and, you know, find out how she's going to afford her life now that she's divorced and she's a freelance writer. When a movie company comes to town and they want to shoot in her front yard. So she agrees to that. And of course, in the movie is one of the biggest stars in the world. His name happens to be Leo. Yep. A lot like okay. that Leo, not, <laughs> not the Leo, but very similar. So we have, you know, Leo, the handsome actor, and we have the romance writer uh, trying to turn out a screenplay and get over her divorce. And uh, the summer unfolds is what I would say. So uh-huh. I really enjoyed this. It's just a page turner perfect for like sitting on the front porch glass of wine reading this book real romance but just some really really funny lines too like actual laugh out loud lines okay Okay. that sounds good yeah Yeah. one of the romances i recommended nora goes off script by annabelle monaghan um if you like leon dolan's work you'll like annabelle monaghan (laughs) okay (laughs) Okay. I think that's a high recommendation then because I love your work. Uh, Okay. And then uh, historical fiction. Okay. This one I read a while ago because I get to read advanced copies of, of stuff, but I loved it because it reminded me of all the British murder mysteries that we've been watching over the course Mm, of the last couple of years. So this one is called the botanist guide to parties and poisons. And uh, it's fun. It's a first, it's a first novel. Uh, for this young writer. Her name is Kate Kavari. And it sounds like it's the beginning of a series, which I like. Uh, So the name of the main character is Saffron Everly. And she Mm. is a, uh, she's a scientist at the University College London in 1923. So it takes place a hundred years ago. She's trying to, you know, she's really only an assistant. She can't really break into the male dominated world of academic sciences, but she, she uncovers a mystery and figures out who does it uh, all amidst all this sort of university turmoil. And there's a little bit of a romance and there's all kinds of plants and botany and greenhouses and all kinds of poisons. <laughs> so it's just a lot of fun. I mean, you can see it immediately becoming a series on BritBox. Uh, so, and I hope it does, <laughs> so, uh-huh. but it's a lot of fun. And I love the name of the character Saffron Everly. So that's a botanist guide to parties and poison. Okay. Great title. Great title. Yeah, it is a fun title. Yeah. It's a great book cover too. And so I think we're going to see more from this writer, but it's good. Okay. For my research, I actually took the book to a beach sisters. Okay. (laughs) And it's a paperback. So that's good. It's called the power couple by Alex Berenson. And here's what I, what I liked about this. It's, it's a couple and the, the wife is an FBI agent doing counter espionage and the husband works for the national security administration. Okay. The two, two decades of marriage, two kids, the couple are trying to rekindle their romance in their marriage with a Euro, European vacation. Love this, that it's set in Paris and in Madrid. Okay, that's great. They bring along their teenage kids for the fund until the unimaginable happens. I don't want to give away the plot, but then it is a real whodunit and you have the husband and the wife and they are working their sources and you get all the backstory about their lives together, uh, their secrets, their difficulties. And it's just moves right along. You can sit under an umbrella and just rip through this book and enjoy it. You know, I always like a spy novel. I like it when they have that. And I love it that the wife is this very strong, smart, powerful FBI agent um, uh, that is working so hard on behalf of her kids. Okay. okay. Oh, I like power that. Couple. Sounds good. Yeah. Mm-hmm. What's the author's name again, Joel? The author, this is The Power Couple by Alex Berenson. Okay. All mm-hmm. right. I'm going to, that sounds like it'd be a good audio book. I'm going to download that. Yes, it would be. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I like to listen to thrillers on audio. Keeps me walking the dog. And it know? goes back and forth between the husband's perspective and the wife's perspective. Ooh, so I think one. it would be good on audio. Yep. Okay. Oh, excellent. Okay. All right, good. All right. Well, speaking of audio, I have a memoir to suggest that I listen to, and it's called Oh Molly. It's the new memoir from the comedian Molly Shannon. 
Yeah. And, you know, I really wasn't sure I wanted to hear any more comedians writing or talking about their lives at Saturday Night Live, right? And their, <laughs> right. Ob- their obligatory Lauren Michaels impressions, like, is there anyone left who hasn't already written about that? But, um, <laughs> but I do love to hear funny people read their own memoirs. And, and this is really so much more than just that stage of her life at SNL. It's really thoughtful, at times really heartbreaking. I mean, it starts with the story when she was four, her mother and sister and cousin were killed in a car accident. Uh, She was in the car, her father was in the car and the other sister. So three of them survived and three of them died. And so it's a lot about her childhood being raised by her father who was left in leg braces after the accident. And it's just kind of a crazy story, like occasionally madcap, uh, chaotic in both good ways and bad ways. Her father is a little, you know, off the rails at times. And they they run all these kinds of scams. <laughs> there's like a, really? I don't know, there's a, a touch of Ferris Bueller, a touch of Paper Moon. And this is all real and sometimes kind of terrifying. And this is not a spoiler because she's already told this story on a lot of the interviews she's done about this book. When she was 12, she and her friend actually stowed away on a flight from Cleveland to New York because her father had kind of dared her, like, I bet you can't do it. And they did it. And so she's got that crazy story in there. And then she's got something else in there which I will not spoil, but it's worth reading just for the career approach that she has that's called the mammoth scam. I'm not going to tell you what that is, <laughs> okay. Okay. but some of you may need to run the mammoth scam on your own careers. Anyway, you end up, it's, it's very up and down, very emotional, but really, really worth I listened to it worth reading or listening to it, but I loved hearing it in her own voice. She said she's a generally positive person with a right. very, with a very dark story to tell. That's the way I'd say it. So okay. it's called Oh Molly. Huh. All right, Liz, say, have you ever seen the other two, the show she's in over on HBO Max? If you're just no. in a Molly. Oh, if you're in a Molly Shannon mood, she plays the mother. And it's very, very funny show. It's very okay. adult situation, but she plays. <laughs> She she plays the mother of these two like wannabe writer actors in New York. And it's a it and then their younger brother becomes Instagram famous. So then the next oh, thing you know. Okay, I've heard you talk about that. Yeah, it's super funny. So if you're if you just wanna it's and it's over on HBO Max. It's probably her lesser okay. known show. Of course, she was in White Lotus this year and everything, but she's so yeah. good in that. Yeah. She's so good in that. Well, oh, you okay. do at the end of the book, you end up feeling kind of happy for her you can feel that she's kind of finding her way creatively and in life um but it's a it's a roller coaster for sure oh Hmm. all right liz that's a good recommendation i actually have it on my kindle but i haven't had a chance to read it yet all right good so that is just a sampling of what's on the satellite Mm -hmm. sisters best beach bag books list there are more so please head on over to i don't know the show notes the website the social media pep talk we are spreading this list around everywhere we hope it helps guide you in your summer next we're going to be talking to international best-selling author dervla mctiernan she's written the ruin the scholar and the good turn and she is back now joining us to talk about her latest book the murder rule which is a legal thriller set in the united states because she was a lawyer for many years and she's putting that to good use stay with us dervla mctiernan up next So you open Google Chrome on your phone, you're hunting for a super rare first edition vinyl of a band you're obsessed with when you're supposed to be working. But this site you tapped on seems pretty shady. And Daryl from IT just jumped up from his desk. Oh no, he's coming your way. It's a good thing built-in malware protection keeps you safe and sound. Not from Daryl though, sorry. There's no place like Chrome. Download Google Chrome on your phone. We're super excited to welcome to Satellite Sisters, 
international best-selling and critically acclaimed writer, Dervla McTiernan. All I know is I love her books. I discovered them during the pandemic and I could not stop listening. The Ruin, The Scholar, The Good Turn. Her latest one is The Murder Rule, and we have all ripped through it and absolutely loved it. Dervla, Dervla we're so happy that you're here and you're here from Australia. Where are you? What, what's <laughs> happening, Dervla? I am in what is often referred to as the most remote city in the world. I'm in Perth, Western Australia, where it's currently just after midnight. Okay, but you're Irish, right? So how did you get to Australia? I know it's very confusing. I I am Irish, but I've been here for nearly 11 years. We left um, a few years after the financial crash. So I don't know if you you guys would probably be aware that it hit Ireland particularly badly um, back in 2007, 2008. And I was a lawyer at the time. I had a little legal practice in the West of Ireland. My husband was a civil engineer. And it's sort of it was like a bomb going off in the middle of our work lives. And by the time the dust had settled a few years later, I was determined never to practice law again. (laughs) And we were sort of looking for a fresh start. And that fresh start took us to Australia. Oh, wow. That's a really interesting story, because actually being a lawyer with a small practice sounds like one, an idyllic situation in Western Ireland, and two, really the basis of a, like a lot of great literature. Yes, it, does. <laughs> it sounds like a crime novel. Yeah. Yeah, it's a lot less exciting in reality, okay. you guys. <laughs> Mostly you know, 300 page contracts and, and uh, a lot of fraught conversations. It's um, less inspiring than you would think. Okay. So, okay, got it. Well, I, as I said in the intro, I discovered your books during the pandemic because I, of course, it's the law. I was listening to a lot of true crime podcasts and I listened to like three in a row where they went into excruciating detail for nine episodes and then never discovered who done it. And I was like, (laughs) I'm over this rubbish. This is rubbish. I'm going to novelists who can wrap everything up in the last 20 pages. <laughs> so I ripped through all your books on audio, your Audible original. I'm so excited to get your new one. Do you listen to a lot of true crime podcasts or are you oh, resentful so of true funny. crime podcasts? I listen to some, like I have listened to Serial, obviously. And I think the most recent one I listened to was the Trojan Horse Affair, which was about this Oh, this letter in the UK. And like I find them just as riveting and I'm desperate to get the end. And I'm always fooled into thinking that there'd be a resolution. <laughs> and I am um, yet yeah, the when there isn't. I don't know why I believe it every time. We're gonna get to the bottom of it this time. <laughs> Well, you do as a as a novelist. Uh, you know that must be very satisfying <laughs> to it figure it very out. Very satisfying. I think that's at least fifty percent of the reason for writing is because you know you know you can create an ending that at least will satisfy you, even if maybe not all the readers. Now, where do you get your ideas? Where do they come from? Oh Everywhere. Um, it's funny. I think every book's been different. The very first one, I don't know where it came from, and it hasn't really happened like this since. But with the ruin. It was always about Maud and Jack. So at the very beginning of The Ruin, we have this 14-year-old girl, Maud, and her little brother, Jack. And there's, you know, this is not exactly how it happens in the book. But in my head, I just had them in the scene. They were sitting on the stairs in this crumbling country house in Ireland, holding hands. And I remember in my mind, it was getting dark outside. It was cold and damp in the house. And they were afraid. And I knew that Maud had protected Jack from the moment he was born, but that she was afraid that she couldn't protect him from what was coming. And I didn't know what was coming. I didn't know what had led them to that place. I just knew some of it. And I really wanted to find out. So I had to write the story to find out the answers. But it it hasn't always been like that because with the murder rule, I kind of started in a different place. Mm-hmm. You know? So each book has come differently. Dervla, for the murder rule, um, wasn't the inspiration for this book a news article you saw? Yes. A few years ago, I read an article about a young Irish law student who, so one of the great traditions in Irish education is when we're in university, we can get what's called a J-1 visa, which allows us to go to the States and work for a summer. Uh-huh. And basically, most of us go over, we work two or three jobs, we have a lot of fun, and we earned our college tuition and came home. And when I went, I went to Bar Harbor in Maine, and I was a chambermaid, and I was a waitress, and I had a great time. <laughs> oh, that's a great spot. Yeah. <laughs> that's what I was spot. thinking as you said that, that every, all the Irish students I know here, they're like, they're basically waitresses or bartenders, and yeah, exactly. so much fun, so much fun. <laughs> it's a grand tradition. <laughs> but this young woman, I read the article about, she went and she volunteered for the Innocence Project, and she you know she was so driven 
that when she came back to Ireland, she couldn't let go of the particular case that she had been working. So she continued working the case and she ultimately tracked down a detective who pointed her to some pitted evidence, some evidence that had been hidden from the defence. And through her work, this man who had spent more than 20 years in prison was released. And I just thought, my God, you know, this is so inspiring because she she did something, you know, she did something with real <laughs> meaning attached. She was so young when she did it. Yeah. Um, but I didn't feel there was a story in there for me. And it was it was quite a bit later when I came across the story again. I did a bit more reading and I found out that after she had found this evidence, it took a further five years before his his case was heard again I and he hear. was released. And at that point, he'd spent 22 years in prison and he was only three years away from his maximum sentence. And I just thought, oh, my God, that is, you know, it's a much darker, more complicated story than the original sort of happy story that I'd read in all the newspapers in Ireland. And I, I had to think, you know, why was, was, was it presented in this way in the first place? And I had a couple of theories. I thought, you know, well, maybe the editor of the paper wanted this brighter tale um, or maybe the Innocence Project had this sophisticated PR machine that was, you know, sending out this message because it would potentially attract more support. And, and I, look, this was just my own theory. It's not based on any kind of fact. But I, I did, it did make me think, if that was the case, if they had done that, would I blame them? You know, they're trying right, to do incredibly right. uh -huh. important work in a really, really difficult environment. And it made me think, OK, what if you're a really good person trying to make a difference in a world that doesn't care about you? What if you take one little step slightly off the ethical path to achieve something? And mm. then when, when you've taken that step, you take one little step more and then maybe one more. Mm -hmm. And where does that lead you? You know, how, how can you actually make a difference in a world where, you know, we're in a post-truth world? And how do you find an ethical path where there's no straight kind of black and white answer? And that was interesting to me. And that, that sort of got me going with the book. Well, oh, such I, a good tease. What a tease. Yeah. I know. I mean, cause we don't want to give away any of the details of the book because there are just plot twists and tur turns. I mean, I said to Leon before we began to realize like, this was like, like a good, like John Grisham book, like in the beginning when a young John Grisham, not like now, not like the old John Grisham when he was really doing it. And I loved in particular the scenes in the Innocent Project office of, uh, um, of the murder rule, because they're so it's so fraught. I mean, our, you know, Hannah is trying to accomplish things, but she's got to do it in, you know, in very clever um, ways in order not to tip off the other uh, workers in the office. Yes. I just love that. Yeah. Oh, thank you, Julie. That's lovely to hear. I really, really appreciate that. I was, it was tricky to get those scenes where I wanted them to be. So I was, I was kind of hopeful I got there in the end. Now, is this your first book set in America? Because I think all the others yeah, are set in Ireland. Yeah, it's my first novel set in America. I have a, a, an, a, an audio novella um, that has just come out that is set in the US, but this is my first full length novel. OK, well, I did miss the Irish narrators. I'm just going to say it. I was like, <laughs> no, wait, I what's know. happening? <laughs> well, Eve is so good. Eva McMahon, who narrated my first books, is so, so good as a narrator. Oh, She's yes. awfully hard to replace. But I have to say I was thrilled with the narrators I got for this book because it isn't easy to find people who can tell a good story. It's tricky. Yes, they're very good. They're, and I, I adapted right away. So don't worry. Please don't write your books for me. I just... <laughs> But this seems like it might be the beginning of a series. We don't want to give too much away, but that had that feel at the it, end. It, it, that's not the plan right now, but actually okay. I would be awfully tempted because I would love to see what happens next with Hannah and with Sean. And Kira. Oh, yeah. Like there's so much, so much there that could be done and they're in an exciting place. You know, I could definitely kick off the story there. So I might come back to it. I have a different book I'm writing on. I'm working on right now, but um, I would love to come back to it at some point. Oh, OK. Awesome. Well, you mentioned your new um, Audible original. I just listened to it. I had a long drive mm -hmm. yesterday, so I, I listened to the whole thing. Oh, what a twist. What's, <laughs> remind me what it's called yeah, again. Did I, did I surprise you? Leah? Yes. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I just didn't. Yeah. You know, okay. what's your responsibility as a writer sort of laying out the little clues for the reader? You know, I mean, you can't just come out of nowhere at the end and go, oh, yeah, this guy over here did it. We never mentioned it. It must be tempting. <laughs> no, that's it would cheating. make it easier to surprise happen, people. Right? When, you, when you get to the end of the book and, and you hear the answer and you go, huh? What? Yeah. I think so. So um, how do you no, think about that? It has that. to make sense, but it's, it's such a tricky balance. I mean, you must find that when you're, yeah. when you're trying to 
you're trying to lay a path that afterwards looks so clear, but in the reading of it does not. Mm-hmm. And it's such a fine balancing act, isn't it? To just yes. sort of say, okay, just I mean, enough. I was definitely stumped. I, I, I did not see this conclusion. Leanne, were you stumped with the murder rule? With the murder rule, yes. And then your audible original is, is the wrong one. I, yeah. I looking back and I'm like, oh yeah, little clues all along. Just a great it job. It makes Just sense. Okay. Job. That's yeah. good. That's really yeah. good. It kind of has to, um, yeah. I mean, with the murder rule, like I, I do find sometimes we focus a bit too much on twists in books. I think, you know, actually at, at the expense of character and story and stuff, you know, it's all about trying to get a twist in, but this was just a book that kind of lent itself to that, at least from my point of view. Um, so it is a bit twisty. Yeah. Um, but that- I enjoyed doing it. So Dervla, it's Liz. I wanted to ask about the difference between writing for audio and writing the actual book mm. book, you know, because I, I listened to the sisters. Of course, that's the one I picked. It's called the sisters. Yay. And uh, <laughs> and we have follow up questions about that one. Uh, but yeah. I'm just wondering how as a writer, how is it different when you know it will only be an audio book? And in this case, that it's kind of shorter than what a full novel would be. Well, you know, the shorter part is more challenging for me than the other. Like, I enjoy writing only for audio because, I, as you say, I know in advance that that's what I'm doing. And so uh, the, the obvious thing is you can cut out some of the attributions. You don't have to say he said, she said. You don't have to put in some of the color that flavors the way a line is delivered. Sometimes I put in, you know, in parentheses, just some little note as to how the tone of something is being said, I guess but not intending that part to be read out. It's just a note for the narrator. I mean, often the narrator will understand from the context and she or he will bring their own performance. But every now and again, if I think it's useful, I might put in a very short note where I might otherwise have to use additional text in the story to give kind of flavor and context and tone. I can sometimes leave that up to the narrator. And sometimes it's better to do that because they're not reading out something that they've already conferred by the tone of their voice and their performance. You know what I mean? Yeah. Mm-hmm. I'm thinking how stupid that would sound if they are <laughs> yeah, like, exactly. woo. And then they said, she said it excitedly. Like, that would be idiotic. <laughs> exactly, exactly that. So you're trying to avoid those sorts of moments and, and looking for opportunities for um, how you can do it. Now I have not done a huge amount of really inventive writing for audio. Like there, there are other writers who've really taken the form different directions. I haven't done that, but I do try to read um, the novellas out loud at least once, if not twice to get a feel for the rhythm of it so that I know it's going to flow nicely. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm conscious of that sort of stuff. So that's, that's kind of it. The, the writing short is a bit more challenging because I, I like to layer a story up. That's kind of how it starts to feel satisfying for me. And if you're going to layer it up with multiple different things happening and then you have to close it all off in a satisfying way that doesn't feel hurried, I'm not sure I've always been awesome at that one. Mm-hmm. It's uh, <laughs> something I'm working on. Mm-hmm. You know, that. That's so, sort of a dream for most writers is when someone tells you, no, no, write less words. Yeah. Like, because you, you're like, oh God, I got 40,000 more words to write when you're halfway through a draft. Isn't there so. a quote, uh, so, uh, somebody very famous from many years ago who said, who, who wrote a very long letter and said, I'm, I'm so sorry, I didn't write you a shorter letter. I just didn't have time. <laughs> <laughs> it's so hard That's to true. write short because, you know, to get it, everything in, in those few words. <laughs> okay. Liz mentioned we had a couple questions about the sisters, but yeah. also also about your other your other books which are set in Ireland and feature sort of a rundown detective and you know a lot of drinking but honestly Dervla what is beans on toast and why there's so much <laughs> every month we know oh, is eating Leanne's beans on toast Leanne doesn't Leanne's the only one that doesn't know go ahead you just had no idea there were so many beans on so many oh my god so it beans the beans I mean are sort of like they're beans in a kind of a tomato sauce they come in a tin <laughs> oh and then the yeah. kind of food you have in the back of your your cupboard when you've run out of everything else and you just make your toast and you warm up your beans and sauce when you put them on top it's really it's like student fare you know it's, okay. it's basic yeah. like ramen yeah. noodles yeah think about it that way yep yeah. i was just hoping there was more to it than just a tin of beans on toast but I'm no so that's sorry. it that's no <laughs> <laughs> All right, fine. And there's a lot of drinking. I mean, who sometimes I think, how can all these people stand up to solve these murders? <laughs> you know, it's so funny. Well, I, I, I set out to write that book and I said, you know what? I am not making 
my detective a drinker because I'm not playing into that Irish stereotype of the drunk Irishman. I'm just not doing it. And I was so determined. And then literally the first note I got from my editor for The Ruin was, Dervla, there are a lot of pubs in this book. I think we need to cut back a little bit. <laughs> I was like, really? Really? That's a lot. So yeah, I mean, he's not a, he's, he doesn't have a drink problem. He's not a heavy drinker, but yeah, he has the odd pint all right. There's no doubt. Yeah. Well, a lot of drinking at lunch, apparently, in your country. Yeah. So well, I, I don't see the problem being with oh, that one. Okay, that's fair enough. Fair enough. Fair enough. Fair enough. Well, we have really enjoyed this. Liz, do you have any more questions on the no, sisters? No, I was just going to say that one of the things I also liked about the sisters is that one is a cop. What are they called? The guardy? Yes. Yes. So one is a cop and one is a defense lawyer. Um, yes. But there are a lot of good barristery type words in there. So so <laughs> yes. so that's good. So it's basically a law and order setup. We're like, for, so right from the beginning, you know, you, you got to have a law and order scenario here. And then you're just it. into it really quickly. And I like I liked the fact that they were on different sides of things, but also roommates and had some of that drama going going on between them like when the sister comes home and the other sister has all of her drunk friends there eating pizza <laughs> in the living room it's something we yeah. many of us who have had sisters as roommates have experienced Deborah. well so. i have to, i have three sisters you will not be surprised to hear so um, yeah I have, I have a direct experience of that one myself <laughs> it's really good do you do you ever so miss being a lawyer have you missed it for one hour since you've left being a no. lawyer <laughs> uh, to be absolutely honest, I have not missed it for one hour. I, I think, I, I mean, I was a lawyer for 12 years, so it was a, it was a long enough time to really experience it. And I, maybe I, re if I had any regrets, it's maybe that I didn't approach it in the way I could have done. I mean, you could be any, there's so many different kinds of lawyers you could be. Um, and, and where I ended up going was sort of a direction maybe I could have gone another way. You know, it was very much sort of commercial law and property and, and not very interesting stuff. But I think, in all honesty, if I could go back, it would just be to be a different kind of person than the person I was in my early 20s. I was, mm -hmm. I was uh, sort of very keen to follow all the rules. It took me a while to break out of that, but huh. I think it does for a lot of people. Ooh. Ooh. Well, good we're tease. glad you're writing. Good we're tease. glad you're writing, though. Yeah, that's a good thing for us. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all right. So we've mentioned a lot of Dervla's books because we've enjoyed them all and listened to them all. But her new one is The Murder Rule. And then she also has the Audible original book out, The Wrong One. And Liz mentioned uh, The Sisters. That's an Audible original. But lots of other great books by Dervla McTiernan. Of course, they'll all be in our show notes and in our newsletter. And we'll spread them around on our website. Dervla, thank you so much. Enjoy enjoy your time out with this new book. I know you're coming to America to make a few spot stops. So that's super exciting. So, you know, we welcome you to California. Have a great time with the mur murder rule. Thanks for being on Satellite Sisters. Thank you so much for having me, Leanne and Julie and, and Liz. It was lovely to talk to you all. Thank you. This was fun. Thanks. Bye. Bye, guys. Oh, that was really fun to talk to Dervla. She was a sport to do that because it was midnight there. Oh <laughs> so we God. appreciate that. She was great. So interesting. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 Her work is just really good. I love it. I love it. Um, okay. S speaking of, um, well, speaking of books, well, we've been speaking of books the whole time, <laughs> but just want to remind people in the tri-state area. Yes, I will be in Southport, Connecticut on May 12th at Pequot Library. And I will be at Theodore's in Oyster Bay, Long Island on Sunday, May 15th at 2 p.m. With the Theodore's one, I want to just get, tip people off. I have to get to JFK pretty quickly after that book signing. So, uh, so feel free to come early. I'm going to be there early and I suggest that you register. We're going to put the link in the show notes and everywhere and pre-order the book. Feel free to show up a little early. I mean, it is the Dolan way, uh, <laughs> yes, but I is. just kind of have to hop in the car and return the rental car and like get on a plane and head to Los Angeles that night. So, um, so it starts at 2 PM, but Feel free to come early is what I'm saying. I'm inviting okay, you so you're not going to wait in the back to have a dramatic entrance. No. You'll, you'll be milling yeah. around in advance. I will be yes. absolutely milling around. I don't want to miss the opportunity to say hi to people or sign people's books. I mean, I'm not running out the door afterwards, but it's... I but can't. you'll be, it will be on your mind that you're trying. Yes. <laughs> yes. So if you have good, if you have questions for Leon, ask her before. Okay. Yeah. No, I wanted, I wanted to do the Saturday, but they didn't have a slot. So Sunday and then I'm... And I'm getting on a flight and flying, flying home. So uh, it's, you know, the rental car 
return. That's the question. It's unpredictable. So, okay. Yeah. At JFK. Okay. Don't I get, go into don't it, get but... anxious about it now. Yeah, it's going to be. <laughs> <laughs> I know I am. I am. All right. But I would love to see people in Southport or in Oyster Bay, Long Island. All right, Liz. Okay. All right. Well, that's a good heads up. Now we're getting into what we call the hodgepodge portion of the show. <laughs> So, because we have a million books, you can look it up. But in the, <laughs> now that we're into hodgepodge, you guys, I have a business concept that I want to run by you. And because it's something that act, is actually happening here in my neighborhood. So it's a dog thing. That's why I thought I would want to hear your thoughts on this. It's a dog thing that just opened in Santa Monica. It's a private membership dog park called dog people but of course okay. people is just ppl so dog ppl because that's that's the hipster way right mm -hmm. so okay so there's obviously room for dogs the dogs can run around it's a fenced area it's right in like downtown santa monica um fenced in but inside the area they've also got a cafe and a bar so mm -hmm. the humans there's coffee wine snacks so you know some human drinking and snacking they have a shop uh that is they call this a collection of curated canine centric products so that's I'm, cur I'm curious I'm curious about that then all the human furniture is uh complete with usb ports so now you see where we're going with this, uh -huh. right? Yes. You can just plug your laptop right in. But it does say on the website, we are not a substitute for WeWork or your home office, but we are indeed about all of your own productivity while your dog plays. And then it says conference calls are permitted, but should be kept brief and do not pace the park while, while on calls. Okay. I don't know. There's just something about the. I feel like this is a fantastic idea in many ways mm. but then when I got to the section where you apply for membership not that I was going to do it I was just curious membership this is where I want your reaction it's for one dog which comes with a human right for one dog any size dog or is any it... size dog okay any size okay. dog all that's, dogs that's are the nice. same are okay. the same price okay 80 bucks a month oh yeah so and if you have two dogs, it's 105, three dogs, 130. I don't know. You guys seem to be taking, I just thought 80 bucks a month for a dog park when there are like many delightful free dog parks. Okay. You have to bring your own coffee. To the right. right. Anyway, it just seemed like a really great idea until I got to the pricing, but you guys tell me what's your reaction to the concept. And then what's your reaction to the pricing? You know, I have a dog no one wants at a dog park. It's a German <laughs> Shepherd. That's the truth. Like, they are not welcome at dog yeah. parks. Uh, so it's hard for me. I thought the pricing was going to be more because it's Santa Monica. You uh, thought it was going to be more? Wow. Yeah, yeah, I did. Well, the way you set it up, I thought, oh, because, you know, people are idiots and they'll pay anything. So <laughs> it just doesn't sound, it sounds more like a place to meet dog owners than a place to exercise your dog. It's about the people, I, yeah. for sure. Right. Yeah. Well, I mean, I observe in our dog park that many people are just sitting down on their phones, uh, and they're uh, and they're not paying playing with their dogs. You know, yeah, they're just sitting down in the park. So this seems like an elevated park. Okay, so that's yeah. got to be worth something, and eighty dollars a month. Uh, yeah, I mean, maybe you'd meet other like minded dog owners. You know, and you could have a cup of coffee, glass of wine. I, I, I thought it was going to be more money because it was California. I, okay. I really did. Okay. All <laughs> it right. It seemed kind of reasonable to me, yes, you know, but again, I like to walk. I, I, I don't, I don't, I don't go to the dog park that often because I think both of us should get exercise, the dog and. Oh, the, okay. So, but I, I have observed at dog parks that most people are just sitting around. Right. So. Why, why not make it really enjoyable and pleasurable? Yeah. Well, one thing you do get for your money while you're sitting around on your conference call, ignoring your dog or trying to meet other dog owners, they do have like camp counselors. They call them referees. <laughs> <laughs> so nice. nice. I guess you want to pay their referees. Anyway, 
I mean, so you don't even have to watch your own dog. The whole point is that you can do the conference call and your dog can play. Yes. No, that's, it's like a babysitter. It's like, yeah, yeah. Uh, you have to be there. You can't leave your dog there. You have to, I mean, but doggy daycare costs a lot of money, Liz. So uh, maybe it's not, it's not that unusual. And it's probably, I guess that's true. I mean, it's better than going to a sports bar, right? I mean, I, I think there's many positive aspects. I think it's really, it's an ideal concept. There are so many people who are working from home now and just working all the time. Like I get it as a concept. I guess even I, I just thought, well, that's a lot, but okay. Interesting to get your reaction. Apparently they did some, some consumer research with the consumers like you. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I have to tell you that I met a dog at the dog park the other day. It was absolutely gorgeous collie. You know, you know, like a big full coated collie. Yeah, I love and that. I was talking, I, you know, those dogs are just, they're gorgeous. Look, it's yeah, like, yeah, lassie, yeah, yeah. you know, and I, I said, oh, that's, you know, your dog is, he's really beautiful. And I said, what's his name? And she said, Frazier. And I said, oh, Frazier. She said, yes, everybody thinks it's like the TV show, Frazier. But his real name is Jamie Frazier <laughs> from Outlander. Okay. <laughs> and I, of course, because Leon and I have watched Outlander for many, many years, I went, oh, Jamie. I was like, it was like a whole new meaning. I mean, my husband didn't know what we were talking about. You know? And I was like, Jamie Frazier, this Polly. Oh, that's funny. That's, oh, that's funny. good. When your dog's name has like a whole subtext to yes. it. I yes. I like it. That's a like private it. club. Yes. <laughs> I like it. All right. Hodgepodging along. Liz, I wanted to just do a follow up on your Irish Island costume. Mm-hmm. I know you were working with the theme of poets and writers, but I saw this headline in the New York Times and it literally spoke to me. It said Irish writers, poets and playwrights are rightly celebrated, but no one knows about Irish clockmakers. So I wonder what? if you're missing an opportunity in your headwear to just have an, a giant Irish clock on your head. I wonder if that's like the oh. perfect headwear to finish off your costume because there's a whole Irish museum of time. I had no idea. They no, me neither. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> apparently, yeah, Irish clockmakers have been out there doing the thing. And they Is are that why we're fun. early to everything? The <laughs> Is that, is that the Irish clock making gene that we got, Liam? <laughs> Maybe it is. I don't know, Liz. Just think about it. Big clock okay. on your head. I think it would look good. <laughs> My costume is going to require a lot of explaining anyway. So I might as well go with the <laughs> clock on my head. I did pick up the the map of Dublin jacket dress slash cover up. Oh, how does it look? It looks good. Yeah. Oh, okay, good. good. Yeah, oh, okay. I'm just, you know, I'm really glad I did not attempt that myself. It's yeah. nicely. We are stuff. too, Liz. We are really glad you. So in an end, haven't really settled the footwear thing yet, uh, but I did just at least buy a pair of green sneakers. So if I have to just go with that, I'm going to go with that. <laughs> if I have time to be, for people that have no idea what we're talking about, go listen to last week's episode. Okay. You just, <laughs> it's too complicated to explain what I'm attempting to pull off here at a costume party. I think um, technically two weeks ago, because last week's was the travel show. So it was two, oh, week, yes. two weeks oh, ago. Oh, right. Okay. Right. All right. So um, anyway, I will report back once it all happens. There will be some photos, but big clock on my head. There's still time to make that happen. Ha, 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 ha. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. That is our show for today. Special thanks to our guest, Dervla McTiernan. We'd like to thank our engineer, Sergio Enriquez. Thank you, Sergio. Emily Loudermilk is our graphic designer. You can see Emily's great designs in our pep talk. You can see them on our Instagram feed, which is at Sat Sisters, or in our f- Facebook group. We'd love for you to join that. Just Google uh, the Satellite Sisters Facebook group. It's a private group. Um, all right. I know people have things to do, places to go. So what's on our to-do list for the week? I, mine is blank. So that's not a good sign. Julie, what's on your to-do list? Well, I am going to print off the whole list of books, Leanne, so that oh, I yeah. can start reading some of these. I'm really excited about this. And uh, thank you very much. You should, a, a big thanks to Leanne for doing all the pre-reading yes, and, screening yes. and editing these books. Uh, this is a real treat and something I look forward to every year is reading some of these beach bag books. 
Thank you, Julie. Liz, what about you? Well, now I see I have a major headwear decision to make, Leah. So, <laughs> you know, because I like your concept. I do. I like it. You know, requires some explaining. And I don't know where you get a clock hat or okay. whatever. <laughs> Etsy, Liz. Etsy. Okay, like everything I mean... exists on Etsy. Exactly. So I'll be hitting Etsy as soon as we're done here. Thank you. <laughs> All right, on my to-do list, I am headed to the East Coast. Couldn't be more excited. I mean, it's great. It's going to be great to see people, but also I'm getting to see our Aunt Nancy and my brother Jim and our sister oh, Mary and my niece yes. Megan. It's, I, they're Megan's children I have not met yet. So I'm looking forward to that. I'll see my sister Sheila, our cousins Tom and Lynn. So look and old friends and, and, and new. So really looking forward to my trip to the East Coast. Just getting ready for that. Have fun, Leanne. Yeah, yeah, it'll be exciting. All right, we're the Satellite Sisters. Sisters, have a great week. You too, too. Leanne. Don't forget, call your Satellite Sister. <laughs>